Well, welcome, Tim. Uh, thrilled for the opportunity to have a conversation with you. Um, thrilled that our church has been able to partner with you. Why don't you kind of reintroduce yourself? Okay. Uh, Debbie and I serve in Ecuador uh, these last 33 years uh, with a uh, National Teen Challenge Ministry we started 25 years ago in Quito, the capital city. And uh, we're very involved uh, the whole time in the jungle work with the Shuar Indians. The exciting thing uh, the last several years is they've made a road coming in, coming into the deep jungle. Well, tell me a little bit about what it was like to get there prior to the road. I'm oh. assuming that was... Yeah. We would fly about 80 miles into deep jungle uh, by bush plane, land on a dirt runway. Then I would hike to my different villages, um, sometimes uh, 6, 8, 12 hours away, the different villages in that area. And then I would have a 12 hour hike, 25 miles out of the jungle uh, to catch the nearest bus on a, a road that came somewhat closer. And then 12 hours back to Quito uh, driving. So that's what I did for many, many years until I'd say three or four years ago this road came in. So that's been a great blessing. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible blessing. So how many villages have you been able to have some level of relationship and, and raise up uh, some leadership in? We have 40 villages yeah. currently and growing uh, that we are ministering in currently. I would say we have at least 600 more villages to reach. <laughs> well, that's a lot of work. I know that you have a, a unique opportunity right now just in terms of uh, leadership development. Clearly there's a, a big demand for that expanding yes. into these villages. So tell us a little bit about this uh, project that you're okay. looking for. Our vision is to establish a seminary and a leadership center yeah. to reach both those huge provinces, the hundreds of villages that will be coming uh, to Christ in these years to come. And so we have a five acre piece of property that overlooks the beautiful Pastasa River Valley where I hiked, you know, those hundreds and hundreds of miles for all those years. Um, to uh, designate it for that leadership center. And we're looking to start that uh, in the year 2020, this next year, uh, to start the construction and really get that underway uh, to conserve the harvest. The future leaders uh, mean that's everything to the Shuar Indians. We have missionaries now that go out, uh, but we want hundreds more uh, to reach the harvest. That's great. So uh, this is, you said it's five acres of land? Yes, five acres, uh, it's right off the main road, and we're building a little driveway, a road into it. And uh, we're looking to put a, a beautiful library, uh, teaching rooms, uh, apartments, so that uh, teachers from the states, as well as from Quito and, and other countries can come uh, and teach and, and be somewhat comfortable in deep jungle, if there is such a word uh, <laughs> to do that. And uh, we're going to need a lot of teams and a lot of funds to be able to do that and, uh, and some funds to purchase the property right now, too. So uh, how much to purchase the property? We need $5,000. That's great. And then for the development of the property and, and building, obviously part of that is materials, but also part of that is kind of mission team oriented. Everything, the whole complex, and it's going to be a large one, will be $250,000. Wow. It'll be a, I'm looking at it to be a five-year project yeah. and a lot of teams and a lot of resources uh, for that. And so if you want to come, please come with a team. We can use all the help we can get. So if someone were sending a team, if a church were sending a team, how small can they be, how large can they be, and what kind of skills are required that would be helpful to show up with? Team can be from four people up to 18 people. Uh, we have a beautiful guest house. I call it the... Schwar Hilton Inn, yes. four and a half stars, uh, because we have actually running water, electricity, <laughs> toilets, and showers. Well, I'm thrilled with your heart and your vision for what you're doing, and uh, grateful for the decades you've put in service. And uh, we consider it an honor to be able to partner with you, and hopefully some of the folks that are watching this will also uh, consider partnering with you. Thank you so much, Pastor Bob. Really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. God bless you. concept is really a simple one. We think that no matter who you are or where you are, that the color of your skin, your education, your income earning potential, and your geography should not be a barrier to hearing about the grace of God. It's just that simple. And there are people who've 
devoted their lives to closing that distance and overcoming those barriers. And so we hold them in high regard and we believe they're worthy of our support and we support our missionaries um, uh, throughout the course of an entire year. And in fact, uh, for those of you who give to missions, you should know every dime of that goes towards them. And in fact, our church gives more to missions than what actually comes in. What I love about uh, missionary efforts like this is that they recognize the value and the strategic alliance that can be developed with indigenous peoples, that this is not just simply uh, Westerners going in and trying to change the culture, but using indigenous peoples to extend the grace of God. And so they have an opportunity to purchase property for $5,000. And this is what I will tell you. Right now, we're in our own expansion project, and it would be so easy just to say, we're not going to focus on anything else right now because we need to get this done. But you should know it's never, never been all about us. Even our expansion project is to reach people in our community that are not currently connected with the grace of God. And so we don't think we should just be focused on ourselves. We think there's a real opportunity to make a difference in other places in the world, and we think this is a, a remarkable opportunity. In fact, in the last service, we had someone from Ecuador who was in the service. They came to the United States uh, in the early 90s, and uh, they told me they actually know where that place is, and they were so excited, and they asked if there's a mission team that's going back there. They would absolutely love to be a part of that. This is what I would like our church family to do. And I know we could focus completely on our own project. I would like our church family to be able to purchase that property for them, $5,000, and say we believe in what you are doing and in the leadership potential of people you are raising up and investing in. And so if you would like to participate in that, uh, you can mark uh, a check or your envelope for Ecuador, or if you like, the, the seminary in the jungle. And uh, you can also give online, you can uh, text to give, there's all those options available. And what you should know is every dollar that you contribute towards that will go to that. If our church raises $6,000, they'll get all $6,000. We don't hold something back. So uh, I'd just like you to prayerfully consider that option. We think that's a, a worthwhile investment of our time and our resources. And uh, we're talking about the possibility of uh, a missions trip uh, from our church family in 2020 to help with some of the uh, actual construction part of that. So if you're interested in that, we'd love to hear from you as well. We're in Hebrews, the eighth chapter today. Uh, we were in chapter 11 last week, and we kind of jumped ahead to 11 because it focused specifically on resurrection issues, and that was so appropriate for last Sunday's message. Today we are in chapter 8, and we're beginning in verse 7, and it says this, if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God. They will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. By the way, I want to say thank you to, there were a number of you who shifted your usual attendance time to 8 o'clock last Sunday. And that was so helpful. Everyone that was invited and came last Sunday, we were able to have a place for them to park and a seat for them to sit in. And so I really want to say thank you for, uh, for your missional mindedness that made that possible last Sunday. So this passage actually starts with words that startle us. We are told that the old covenant, there was something wrong with it, and that it needed to be replaced. That's an astonishing thing to say. That, that can sound offensive if you've been raised in the context of historic Judaism. And so this was something that just, it, it, it came across as being a stark comment that was being made. And the, the first covenant was actually built on the laws of God, 
the laws of God. The, the ones we are most familiar with would be the Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments are uh, put God first in your life. Don't worship anything or anyone other than God. Use God's name with respect. Uh, remember the Sabbath. Uh, respect your parents. Uh, do not murder. Uh, be faithful in your marriage. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not envy others. But that wasn't the whole law of God. That was like the top categories. And so what uh, great teachers did in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy is that as they examined those laws, they broke them down and parsed them out so that we could better understand them. And those 10 kind of categories of laws actually wound up becoming 613 rules. How would you like to take that test today? and 365 things you should not do, and 248 things that you should do. Now, let me just give you an example of some of those uh, rules, because they're uh, a little bit interesting, all right? But there's one commandment that says, do not be superstitious. That's interesting, isn't it? How about this one? Pray every day. There's a rule. Or this one. There, actually, there was a whole series of commandments about resting on specific days and holidays. Wouldn't it be great if somebody came up to you while you were laying on the couch and they said, what are you doing? And you say, I'm obeying the laws of God. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what's required right now. Or a whole series of commandments about what was good to eat and what was not good to eat. Uh, there, there, was a, there was a commandment that if you were harvesting your crops... While you were bringing that harvest to where you were storing it, if you dropped anything, you weren't allowed to pick it up. And the reason was is because that's how they provided for the poor and the people who couldn't own property and didn't have any way to harvest anything. And so the poor would come and they would follow you and anything you dropped, they could pick up. And that's how they met the needs of the poor in that society. It was, it was a rule. It was a command. Uh, here's another one. Do not appear at the temple without offerings. If you didn't have something to give, you couldn't show up. You can see the problem with that. Or this one, do not remove boundary markers. There were property lines. And as long as there have been human beings, there are people that will go out and move the pile of stones a little bit to gain a little more property. And God says, yeah, you shouldn't do that. Or here's one. If you are single, adult, or engaged, you'll really like this one. This is a command. It's found in Deuteronomy 24. Your honeymoon should be one year long. <laughs> and some of you not right now are going, that first covenant sounds pretty good. Okay? <laughs> A lot of these commands were very specific, and the goal was to identify good things that should be implemented and harmful things that should be eliminated. The problem with the covenant is not that the rules were bad. The problem with the covenant is that it didn't change anybody. It identified problems. It exposed weaknesses. And it even provided temporary relief for your guilt, but you didn't really change. Now, you might think, well, temporary relief for the guilt is fine. Uh, if you've ever been in a situation where you struggle with a life-controlling behavior or an addiction, you know temporary <laughs> relief of guilt is not enough. You just begin to erode on the inside and you wonder if you're ever going to be able to change or become different. So this wasn't just the opinion of some people who were having a church family at the time scriptures were being written. This was actually prophesied by Jeremiah, one of the most articulate and accurate prophets that God ever used in the Old Testament. And he's the one who tells us that there was coming a day when God would actually provide a new covenant. And the reason was is because when you have religion that's based on rules, it has some effects on us. And the first is this. It tends to dehumanize people. We think we see people less as people and more like problems. They're just not keeping the rules. And when people are not good at keeping the rules, we question their intelligence. We wonder about their commitment. We judge their motives. All this stuff happens. But by the way, we don't just do that to people who don't keep the rules well. We do that to people who are good at rule keeping. We say things like, oh, they think they're so perfect. 
Oh, how self-absorbed they are. How self-righteous they are. The very first murder recorded in human history happened because one person was annoyed that another person was doing a better job than they were. That's pretty dehumanizing, too. Can you imagine a marriage that was based on rules instead of relationship? Can you imagine what that marriage would look like? You might get a lot of compliance, but not a lot of intimacy. And there are marriages that kind of devolve over time to be all about what people do, uh, their responsibilities. And what I can tell you is that usually ends in frustration and people feel dehumanized in that process. Can you imagine a set of marriage vows where you were saying things like this, will you make sure dinner's on the table every night by 6 p.m.? Will you make sure that the toilet is always scrubbed and clean? Will you make sure the lawn is mowed and the weeds are whacked? Will you guarantee that you will work so many days a week, every week of the year, and bring home this much money? How many knows? That would not be a great set of marriage vows to listen to, much less say, I do to. It doesn't work. Can you imagine parents building their relationship with their children on rules instead of on love? Now, don't get me wrong. Kids need to learn rules, but the motive is that you want to protect them from harm and help unleash their potential. But if it's all about the rules, you will either break your child's heart or you will harden their heart. It can't just be about the rules. So when it's all about the rules, it dehumanizes people and it depersonalizes God. God stops being someone that we relate to and starts being something that we use. People do this all the time. They, they think that if, if, I, if I follow the rules, then God owes me. God is kind of like this force, this good luck field that you kind of tap into and then things go better for your life. Or some people will even do this. They've got their own private agenda, but they love adding God's name to things that they think so they can control other people. This is not a good way to live. And it's a significant problem. It depersonalizes God. So there are some people, a growing number of people in our culture now, who actually say, you know, religion is the problem. That's all it's about. It's just about the rules. If we could just have a religion-free society, that'd be better. And there are some people who will acknowledge, I don't subscribe to any faith. I don't buy into the organized religion thing. And I think the world would be a better place if more people were like that. And so, is it true? Like, I think it's a fair question to ask, right? And here's what I will tell you is, they're not actually escaping the same gravitational attraction that rule-oriented people do, and I can prove it. So let's suppose you're a person not subscribed to a faith, Uh, You got dragged here for one reason or another today, and so you're here, and you're just waiting for me to be done. And get out of here and get something to eat. Uh, Okay. And let's say one of the things that frustrates you about about faith is some of the rules that they have regarding human sexuality. Because there are some values that are communicated in Scripture, and there are lots of people who think that those values are, are worth living by. And in our culture, lots of people look at that and they go, well, that's, that, it's archaic, it's, it's limiting, it's unnecessary. Now, watch what happens when you start thinking that way. So then what should happen? Well, people, our world would be better off if we didn't have rules like that. And people who think like that are just narrow-minded and they're bigoted and they, they don't prioritize. Other, they're uncompassionate and our world, you'll eventually get here, Our world would be better without them. How is that attitude any different than a person who keeps the rules and thinks the world would be better without you? We haven't solved one thing. We just waved another flag. This is a problem. That's why God couldn't just improve the covenant. God had to make a new covenant. So the first covenant clarified expectations, but it really didn't change anyone. So we use the terms all the time, new and improved, right? Uh, And there was an old comedian who used to say that that was an oxymoron. If you're improving it, it's not new. It's something that already exists. If it's new, it's not, you can't improve it because it's new. 
So, but the, the point is, is that when you improve something, you make it more valuable or more useful or improve its functionality. And, and so that, that's how it works. God didn't say, I'm going to improve the first covenant. God said, I'm going to create a new covenant. So what makes this new? It's a concept that is completely radical. No religion had ever considered it. No one had ever thought about it. It's something so radical. It's unbelievable. Even today, people struggle with it, and this is the idea. If I can get the slide. God does not come to demand a sacrifice from us, but to become a sacrifice for us. This had never been thought of. Always, God demands the sacrifice. Always, when you, when, you, when you do something wrong or in order to please him, you had to bring a sacrifice. That's how it worked. And by the way, that's not just Judaism. Every single religion has some kind of penance and project that you're required to do, a place you need to go, a burden you need to carry, a task you need to accomplish in order to prove your devotion for God. It was always the same. You had to bring the sacrifice, and all of a sudden, there's a new covenant. Radical. No one has ever done it before. By by the way, it hasn't been done since. And that's this. God has not come to demand a sacrifice from us, but to become a sacrifice for us. Now, here's the thing. Once you accept this new covenant, it completely reorients your motives for what you're doing. See, when it's all about the rules, you're either motivated by fear somehow you're going to get it wrong or by pride because you believe that you got it right. But if you accept this concept, you don't earn your status in the kingdom by anything, any work that you have done. You're given status in God's kingdom by work that he has done. This is a very different way of thinking. And there are lots of people who go, well, then people will just live any way they want. What happens is when you're no longer motivated by fear and pride, the motivation that comes from this covenant is gratitude. You're just thankful. And it's amazing what people will do out of gratitude. So let's suppose that I went to a doctor. And let's suppose in my annual checkup, they scanned my head and they found an aneurysm in my brain. And let's suppose they said, this is actually a pretty serious thing. And the best case scenario is if that thing goes, you're going to be incapacitated for the rest of your life. You probably won't survive it. And let's suppose that I discovered there was a doctor in Rochester that was one of the best skilled surgeons in all the country for that specific procedure. I would call his office. And I would say, I, I, need, I need to see you. And if they said, well, our doctor's schedule is kind of full, I would say, wait a minute. Whatever time he needs, I'll be there. And then they would say, well, he only takes special cases. I said, I am a special case. I don't think you know who I am. I'm a pastor. <laughs> I help lots of people. Our church makes a difference in the world. Imagine what would happen if, if I disappeared. I need to get in. All that, that, that's not, see, that's fear and that's pride and that's doing whatever I can to get what I want. But let's suppose I just collapsed on the platform this morning and they hauled me off to the hospital, and as it turns out, that doctor happened to be in the hospital, and they told him about the emergency, and he came into surgery, and he performed the procedure and saved my life. What would I be? I would be incredibly grateful. Now, let's suppose I'm leaving the hospital, and I walk out into the parking garage, and there's the doctor, and his car is dead. And he looks at me and he says, Bob, you're not going to believe this. My car is dead. I can fix brains. I'm not good with cars. Could you give me a ride over to the airport because I need to make an emergency surgery in Boston in just a couple of hours and the airplane is waiting for me. I just need to get there right now. Would I say, oh, doc, that, geez, I'm, I'm behind schedule. I, I, was in the, I was laid up for a couple of days here and... I'm really, really busy, and I've, I've got some very important things to do. I, I don't really do the chauffeur thing, you know? I just, I'm more, I'm more of a proclaimer kind of person, and so, no, 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 
Would I do that? Absolutely not. I would go, oh my God, of course I'd be happy to help any way that I can. Hop in and I'd take him over. And not only would I be grateful and, and, and offer something that he was asking of me, but I would also be grateful because I know when he gets to Boston, he's going to be able to do something for somebody else. Now, some of you are going, well, never mind, I won't go there. All right. <laughs> it is so tempting, but it's not worthwhile. Gratitude. It is amazing what gratitude will motivate us to do. So here's the challenge. The challenge is, is that a lot of us in the room believe, yeah, I know Jesus died for my sins, and, and I live in that model. It's not about the rules, it's about the relationship. Are you sure? Because I will tell you, it is very easy to hear the gospel and accept the gospel and still live like you're in the first covenant. So the writer actually gives us a couple of assessments here to take. This is cool, all right? If, if personal faith tends to create community with others, right? This is what he says. I will be your God and you will be my, not person, people. That when we come into a healthy understanding of relationship with God under this new covenant, as we get healthier with God, we also get healthier with others. It's amazing how much of our relationship is one-upmanship and trying to connect with people that we think will elevate us in life and trying to prove something to someone who didn't think enough of us. And once you accept that Christ has done all of this for you and you've been accepted by God completely, it not just changes, doesn't just change your relationship with God, it changes your relationship with other people. And now, when something happens good in their life, you're not going, well, they don't deserve that. I worked harder than they worked. Some people are just lucky, I guess. You, you can actually celebrate with them. And if someone is needy, you have the opportunity to be generous because God's been so generous with you. Out of gratitude flows this amazingly different way to live. You actually start developing. And this isn't about being an extrovert. You know, you walk in the room and you're always the life of the party and people like hanging around you. This is not about being an introverted or extroverted. It's about understanding that once that relationship with God starts getting healthier, there's benefit to being in relationship with other people. So it creates a sense of community. Personal faith also encourages intimacy with God. He says, you will know me. You will know me. Not just know about someone. See, we can know a lot about someone. That doesn't mean that we know them. You can do a lot of research on someone online. It's called online stalking. You can find out a lot about them. You can talk to people who know them. You can learn things about their personality and their history, but it's not the same thing as knowing them. In order to get to know them, you're going to have to spend time with them. There's going to have to be conversations where not only you are talking, but they are talking. And when it comes to our relationship with God, it's just like building any other kind of relationship. You spend time with them, not just learning the facts about God and the rules about God but actually spending time with God and pouring out your concerns and your challenges and, and the things that break your heart and your hopes and your dreams and the things you wish would happen. You share that freely in a conversation and then you listen. You wait to see how God might direct your thoughts or how he might give you some insight. Even in scripture, it's amazing how many people read scripture just to, to get through the Bible. You know, if, I, if I'm going to be four chapters behind, if I don't read today, I won't be able to check my little box. What if Scripture wasn't about checking boxes? What if it was about when I read this, God can speak through it, and I can gain insights and even direction in my life? That's a very different reason and a very different way to read Scripture. Okay? It encourages intimacy with God. You won't just know about him. You actually know him. And then lastly, it inspires confidence within us. It inspires confidence within us. It said, from the least to the great, they will all know me. This is kind of interesting. I think a lot of us struggle on 
feeling like we're the least. And if you feel like you're the least, you, you don't feel qualified, you don't feel worthy, you don't feel like you belong. You get uncomfortable in rooms where you feel like other people are just better at the faith thing, the religious thing, the prayer thing, the Bible knowledge thing, the character thing. We just start getting very uncomfortable. You feel inadequate. And we'll often try to look for ways to get out of rooms like that. But God says, it doesn't matter if you're the least. You can still know him. He doesn't run out of the room when he sees you. It also says, from the least to the greatest. Very few people in the room, I think, this morning would stand up and say, you found me, I'm the greatest. <laughs> we don't do that. And so we think, oh, that doesn't apply to me. Let's just think, it's not, maybe you don't think you're the greatest, but maybe you think you're a little greater. How would you know? I have a way for you to figure it out. Okay? It's not because you'll think I'm better than somebody else. You'll think this. I've got better places to be and more important things to do than to waste my time here. There it is. That's the assessment tool that lets you know you think you're better. And what God says is time with him is never a waste. And time with his family is never a waste. And it doesn't matter whether you think you don't deserve it or you think you shouldn't have to do it. That once you come into this personal relationship with Jesus, once faith is based on a new covenant, that God didn't come to demand a sacrifice from you, but to become a sacrifice for you, once you've experienced that, completely reorients your life. It's not just knowing about him. It's knowing him. And when that begins to happen, that's when your faith starts feeling real. Let's bow our heads this morning. There is so much freedom and encouragement if you're willing to move out of a rules-based approach to your spiritual life and a grace-based. And I know some of us are afraid, well, that means the rules don't apply. Jesus just summed it up for us. He said, if, if you want to know how to live this thing out, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That when love drives you, you get it right. That that's the motive that makes the difference. And so this morning, if you're living under the fear or the pride that keeps weighing you down and wearing you out, you need to know there's a new covenant and it's personal. It's just you and God. And the minute you begin to walk in that truth, it changes everything. Father, help us today. Help us to be willing to let go of the things that we think make us better or we fear make us worse and trust what you have done for us more than we trust what we have done for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together this morning.